Yes, yes, and welcome to Vasili's Live Lifelong Living Festival. Well, a part of it, folks. I'm here today to talk to you all things about gardening. And uh, please join us uh, in the chat room. Uh, we would love you to include your name and your location, your suburb. Uh, and don't forget to ask your questions because I've got a lovely lady here who's going to be able to feed them across to me. And I'll do my very best to be able to answer them with, uh, I suppose, all the knowledge that I have gathered through my journeys and ventures around people's homes around Australia. Now today we are talking gardening. It is spring and I'm sure many of you have been planting your spring variety or summer range of fruit, flowers and vegetables. And I think I'll just touch base on a, well, a lot of uh, aspects of gardening and we'll start with the soils and work our way up into plant protection and harvesting. Now, I want to thank John as well for sharing us his space here. This canvas of garden that we have as a garden around me is just a die for. There's so many little plants. Well, I won't say little because there are a lot of big plants in here, but most of them are, you know, are pot specimens. Uh, if I could get the cameras to pan around, that would be great, but I'm not going to force it. If you can, eh? we can't do that. We have got that technology here <laughs> today, folks. So I'm not going to take you for a full tour. But it's, uh, it's, an, it's an amazing garden. This is what you can achieve in, in a typical backyard, in a suburban backyard. And it's, uh, I suppose what we can say with this whole concept is space and size doesn't matter. If you've got a small courtyard to acreage, it really doesn't matter. It's up to the imagination on how you can create the perfect environment or gardening environment for you and your family to enjoy. Whether you love flowering plants or edibles or both, there is no reason why you can't do both. And um, I, I, it's, I'm just drawn to actually talk about it because I, I see so many elements here and ideas that we could all take home in our own backyard and apply. Pot specimens. I'm going to do this. I'm just going to go a little bit off the cuff here with the whole concept and have a look at this. Look at this. I was asked to bring some products and ideas and samples, and I'm going to run through all these ideas and products that we have here, folks, and ask any question you, you feel free, uh, which I'll try and answer for you, as far as products or even plant life. But look, take a look at this. This is a cucumber in a pot, and if I was to pick it up, I dare say, oh no, it's a potty mix, it's a little bit heavy, so there may be a blend going on here. So soils, what makes a good soil? And what, what's a bad soil? Uh, and depending on what, are we talking about pot plants or are we talking about the ground? Either way, if you're going with a pot variety, as you can see here with John's place, everything, uh, everything's grown in pots. A potty mix, a good quality potty mix is the way to go if you're not inclined to make your own. And to make your own, you do need a variety of uh, ingredients. And we're talking through the mulch, we need sand, we need a, a peat, we need to have compost added into that as well. Uh, you can add even some garden soil blending into that as well. So to blend that, you need to be able to get the airflow. And a good soil is like making a good compost bin. Whether you're actually making compost or building your garden bed, you need to treat the one and most important vital part of the earth. And understand one, one thing as well. It's a living organism. It's the biggest living organism that we have that around us. The soil has to be treated like it's alive. There are my, microbes in there, there are fungi in there, there are worms, there's bacteria, good and bad bacteria. And you don't want to be feeding on the good, the bad bacteria. So you want to feed the good bacteria. And the elements of doing that and succeeding with that are heat, moisture, airflow, carbon, nitrogen. You need to add all those in. Now by adding those and working on those five elements, you're in essence creating a compost environment, a feeding, uh, feeding room where your plants will benefit as will the microbes giving it to the plants. So whether you have a pot plant or the earth that you stand on and you garden in, it needs to be treated in the same way. If you've been following me on my social posts every morning that we do, I've shown you uh, raised garden beds and garden beds on the ground and even pot plants. We need to consider with a raised garden bed one thing, that there's going to be good drainage. And if you need to control that or it's drying out too quick for you, what we need to factor in is a mulch that we can apply on top. 
with the hot weather coming through, the first and the first thing that goes off on your soil is the dehydration of it. And that in turn creates compaction, lack of airflow, and it starts to kill off the microbes. So if you don't have the airflow, the good microbes die. If the compaction starts to come through, the, the good microbes will die and the moisture won't get through down to the base. So you need to control the temperature by doing the one thing, and the moisture that is, and that's mulching. Now, there's mulch right there. and <laughs> You're welcome to swing around there if you can still hear me. You'll see the mulch on that little uh, rectangular tub, which is fantastic. And I'm going to swing around here. I'm just going to change it up a bit with you guys. Have a look at this. This is the mulch that you need to apply. How does that work? It works with creating a blanket of security. So it stops the heat getting there. It actually stops it from drying out, the soil from drying out underneath. And if it does get really hot, see the fibers, how, the fibers, how they are there. You've got a lot of air pockets in there. Now what happens there is with a little bit of moisture on the mulch, hot air can drive through it. It's like an air conditioner. So what happens is as the air blows through it or even the sun shines on it, that starts to sweat. The airflow and the moisture combined together cools down as a cooler or an air conditioning works. So that keeps the soil below cool. And in the cold weather, it's actually a blanket. It stops it from cooling down. If you were to take all that away, you would expose the soil crust. That in the sun will crust over, that will dehydrate a lot quicker, and that will cause the plants to stress out. So the temperature rises dramatically, causing the plants to dehydrate and the bacteria, the good bacteria, to die off. So you need to mulch. There's nothing more important, well there is a lot of things that are important, but one of the most important elements of keeping a good active compost or soil is the mulch. Now this one doesn't have any, but it sits in a spot there where it's partly protected and there's a lot of canopies around it which will protect it as well. So I'm sure John's got his head around that. Oh, let's talk about the climbing framework. You can make your own, you can buy these kits like that and train your cucumbers, tomatoes if you like through them as well and they will be successful just guide it around. Do not overhandle your cucumbers because what happens there is the cucumber itself becomes bitter so the more you handle a cucumber plant the more likelihood the actual fruit itself or the cucumbers will bitter. So that's a, another thing I learned from a couple of good Italians that I've traveled around. Question already, Vasily, from Kim. Yes. Kim's wondering if it was too late to plant her tomatoes. Not she usually plants them around Melbourne Cup. Not at all. I've actually, I've still got about, so Kim, your tomato planting uh, is, you've got plenty of time. And obviously, if you've got tiny little seedlings, they're going to take a lot longer to grow. But with this weather, they grow literally overnight. Uh, if you've got a medium-sized seedling, for example, something like that, there's no harm at all in planting that tomato. Now the secret, well it's not a secret because I've been sharing it a lot, uh, the, a good trick or a great way to kick on your tomato plants is to actually bury two thirds of the plant. Now I've brought a little tired looking tomato because this, well I had about 20 given to me and I haven't fed, fertilized them and these have actually been grown in garden soil. This is not potty mix, it's actually garden soil. So that there, and it's a healthy little plant, it needs a liquid fertilize to bring it on and green it up. A secret, well I keep saying that, it's not a secret, a trick to planting these tomatoes, you may have seen this on my little blogs in the morning, is for example here, we've got this tomato, it's about 20 centimeters in length, we've got the root ball here, Generally, and I'm going to make a mess of this table, that's okay. Generally what we do is we take the seedling out of the punnet like that. It will dig a little hole, open it up slightly larger than what the actual root ball is. And we'll end up burying it to there. Pretty common scenario. That's what 99% of gardeners do. And it's, it's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. You'll actually get a tomato plant to grow. What I like to do with most plants, and in particular with the tomato plants, is to rather, rather than planting it straight down like that and covering it over, I would actually plant it like that and then twist the end out of the ground and cover that entire stem over. Now, you would pinch off all these leaves that are going to be buried, and at the end, all you'll have is this little plant sticking out. But what you've created here is the engine. 
that's where all the magic begins to happen. Once all this is covered, that's the stem that is, once all that comes into, comes in direct contact with soil, that plant will grow all these new roots. So imagine in, within the first two weeks, with a little bit of moisture and quality composted soil around it, all these new roots developing before this grows. And then two weeks onwards, you're gonna see this jump out of the ground like, like Jack and the Beanstalk. That will grow so fast, and because it's got a strong root ball, its own self-defense mechanisms kicked in with quality composted soil, liquid fertilizing, and natural fertilizers. That's gonna be the safest way. And Kim, go for your life, plant them. I've still got about 20 to do. Uh, I still got to build the garden beds and compost them properly. So I'll be planting till about mid to late December. You may not get the full production of crop that you want, but if the weather allows it, you never know. You may be lucky. Any more questions coming through? Not just yet. That's good. <laughs> yep. So if you've got any questions, feel free to send them through. Make sure you put your name in there and your suburb, because at the end of this session, there's a prize to be won, apparently, I've been told here. So there's a little hamper here with a lot of goodies, uh, and we're going to be drawing it at the end of the day, and some lucky person's going to receive it by the end of the day as well. So we've got Eco Neem, we've got our Eco Boost. <laughs> this is fantastic, look at that, Eco Gold. And if I can just put it out there, folks, you're not going to find two better liquid fertilizers. Now, if I can say quite confidently, We've done a lot of testing with the products out there currently and our ones as well and ours really do have an amazing result. Certified organic and you'll see the little certification there. So they are not, sorry for moving these around too much on you Mr. Camera Operator. <laughs> these are not to the minimum standards, they're way above the Australian standards. So these will make a huge difference to your garden and what they really do feed are the microbes it's not the plant so much but the microbes so have a look at these and try them out you also get a magazine and a sprayer and a black grit and a <laughs> Vasily's cap all right well make sure to put your details down and there'll be a lucky winner at the end of this uh, session so planting vegetables Make sure you do plant them loosely. Do not have to tease the roots out too much. This really doesn't need to be teased out. If you've got a pop down plant, by all means do that. But when you do that, you, may, you need to make sure it's hydrated. Don't pull it out like this is now dehydrated a little bit. Don't go teasing the roots of any type of plant unless you've hydrated it first. That will help to loosen the soil up without tearing the, the fibrous roots. And if it's really, really compacted, you're better off putting them in a tub of water. So take the entire pot or plant without the pot and sit it in a tub of water and let it soak through into the center. You'll find that with a little bit of jiggling around, those roots will start to come apart on their own without too much effort. That's a safe way to do it because the more you tear the roots, the, the further the plant goes through a stress, stress cycle, which means it'll go backwards a little bit before it grows. It really depends on the type of plants. Um, I've got some eggplants here as well, and I thought for those die-hard gardeners out there who've never done it before, I'll quickly demonstrate how to graft an eggplant onto a tomato. It's quite a popular thing uh, that's been going on for years. Normally we would graft, or you'll, well, you'll find in your local garden centre and hardware stores uh, alike, grafted eggplants. They're generally grafted onto a rootstock, a tomato rootstock, which is uh, of the cherry variety. Uh, there are a number of cherry varieties, uh, wild cherries, that grow and they're quite resilient to our soils and uh, disease and products and problems like that in the earth. So they graft them onto that for, for that reason primarily. And second to that is that they actually get a longer production out of the eggplant itself. Uh, but also, uh, through my travels around Australia, uh, there's been a lot of grafting done on plants or eggplants onto the devil's plant, uh, which is also known as Cal's Adder, uh, Solana Mimosum. It's quite a spiny plant. It has a lot of spines along the stem and the leaf itself. So similar to your eggplant, as it develops, you might find a few spines along the leaf. By comparison to the eggplant, the let's say this was a devil plant, it'll have something of... The 10 times in size. So if it was only a, a three millimeter spine on the eggplant, it'll be a 10 to 20 millimeter spine and it will hurt. It's like your typical rose spines. We graft those, the eggplants onto that sort of rootstock because it's an evergreen. 
It will last through winter, providing you don't get frost landing on your eggplant. And if you do, you can create a little mini hothouse over the top, which will protect the eggplant through the wintering winter periods. And then this or the following springtime, you'll find because they are slow to grow and our weather really needs to warm up. They need 24 degrees temperature in the soil for them to start producing well. And you can achieve that, uh, well, you can achieve eggplants a lot earlier by grafting onto a rootstock like the devil's plant. I haven't got one here today, but I do have the tomato, which will have a similar effect. If you do protect it through winter and you are successful in that, it will still produce early the following spring. So you'll be able to pick eggplants, the fruit themselves, October, November, rather than January, February, March, which is almost at the end of our cycle. So to graft something like that, what we need to do, and it's pretty similar to grafting fruit trees, I suppose, or any other plant, and that's the sign wood, and this would be classed as a sign wood, which is the top half. We're not doing a bud graft, we're doing a, a split, which is a V-shaped wedge. Now, while I talk about v, v, uh, v and wedge shape cuts, Tools, the tools that I use, I've been using Falco for a long time. These are all rusty ones I, I left out in the rain. My fault, I haven't cleaned them. Um, they're a fantastic tool and I'm sure many of you have got one of these. You love them, I love them too. But I've recently stumbled across Lowy and I have literally just fallen in love with these. Really just love these tools. Now they've got, this is an anvil cutter and you can see, see how it's, when it cuts, it actually has a sliding effect. So the top blade not only just shuts down onto the bottom blade, so it's not a bypass, it doesn't slide past, it stops on the, bo on the bottom blade or the, the, the base. But while you move the, the cutting blade on top, it does a slicing effect. So it doesn't just come down straight onto the wood, it actually slices. And I'll do that slowly and you'll see. See how the point of that or the front of that top blade kicks out? So it's not an even opening, it's quite out of shape. And you'll see that slice. So that is, and that, that mechanism itself takes at least 50% of the stress load and the torque required to cut. If you had two pieces of dry wood and you used a good, well, top quality Falco, and I'm sure Falco's got an anvil cutter as well, and an anvil, so a secateur, bypass secateur versus an anvil, you don't need a mechanism other than this mechanism itself. You don't need any uh, ratchet clamp sort of style cutting uh, system to help you. That will do it in half the strength required with half the effort. So consider having a look at anvil cutters. It's not just Lowy, I'm sure there's other brands out there like Falco, but I've fallen in love with Lowy at the moment. So these are my go-to tools. Quality, clean, sharp tools are required. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take the top half of this off, like that. We're also going to remove all these extra leaves, like that. And I'm not sure if you know this, this is a very small plant, but anyway, if this was, because you'll find some larger seedlings in maxi pots. See that there? I'm just taking these leaves off here. See that leaf there? itself, that there, that there now, if I was to take that and stick it in the ground, in some soil, in partly protected shade, that will grow into a tomato plant. In fact, any part of the tomato plant that you remove from your seedling, like this, that, that, and all the other leaves as well, all these can be propagated. You can use a Rudex gel if you like, you can use honey, you can use powders, whatever you, you prefer to use, all of them will grow. So you can take cuttings from the one tomato plant. You don't have to buy a hundred. One tomato plant will give you a hundred. So as the plants grow, as we remove laterals off the plant themselves, you can plant all those laterals straight into the ground. You don't have to do anything. Literally bury it two thirds of the way like that and watch that grow. It'll wilt over for the first few days, but eventually it will grow. Silly, we've got a heap of questions coming in. Okay. Now. So Jim wants to know, he's a first time planter of vegetables. Yep. What are your um, top six veggies that'll, that'll grow for a first time? Oh, okay. Top six veggies, spring onions, lettuce for a first time gardener. Spring onions, lettuce, 
chicory. Uh, give, it, give it a go. It's a bit late now for broccoli, uh, unless you've got a bit of shade there. Your tomatoes, definitely tomatoes. Uh, cucumbers. Have I done six? Eight? Spring onions, lettuce, chicory, tomatoes, cucumbers. And what's another one that I've seen growing out of control? Put some strawberries in. They don't need much attention. How's that? So another question from Tanya. She's looking at compatible gardening. Yep. She's planted tomatoes, chilies, oregano and basil all in the same garden bed. Yeah. Is there an all-in-one fertiliser that she might be able to use for this? <laughs> okay, so fertilising. So all-in-one fertiliser for a variety of plants. Um, all right, I'm going to lay it out here. We're, as you know, most of you would know it by now that we've gone into our own product range and branding and all that sort of stuff. So my background, for those who haven't followed me long enough, I've been in the industry for about 30 years uh, professionally. Uh, I've been presenting on television and radio for the last 20. Um, I've taken the back, sort of the laid back approach to it. I've not scripted, as you can tell, I stumble and fumble through it. Uh, and why I say all this is that I've done a lot of uh, traveling to people's homes. I've seen a lot of products. We've had a retail garden center for years on end. Um, and all that, this is open and I'm leaking everywhere, just realized. Uh, and all that has been an opportunity for me to be able to evaluate what's going on in the industry, how the commercial and the manufacturers are thinking, what they're doing. We're talking the likes of the big stores and the big uh, manufacturers like Yates, Multicrop, Seasol, um, you know, the Charlie Carps, Nutrog, they're all great companies. They all have an, the good intention in, in, and heart in mind. But what I've noticed is, and not all of them, but at least half of them, they do bring out a range that's specific to a, 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 a plant, a tomato, uh, your gardenias, your, your native plants. So we're talking your typical uh, citrus fertilizers, your tomato fruit and vegetables fertilizers, your camellia azalea fertilizers. They're all good and proper to have all that range. But what ends up happening to the home gardener is they'll have you know, 15 or 20 different products on, in their garden shed that they have to go out there and say, okay, my azaleas need this fertilizer and I can't use that on that because that's, it says azalea camellia food. So it surely can't be used on my tomatoes. I've come in and I'm dumbing it down. And I dare say some of them don't like what I'm doing. The point is that it needs to be done because I'm, I'm listening to both you at home and watching what the uh, manufacturers are doing and the brand companies are doing. Uh, and yeah, we brought out a range. And our range is pretty simple. It's pretty much the black grit and the two liquid fertilizers, our EcoBoost and Liquid Gold. Use your liquid fertilizers on anything. And if you're gonna feed your garden, if it's not from an animal, if it's not composted from your bin, and if it's got lots of different colors in it, well, that in particular, the colorful little balls, just steer right away from it. You don't need it. Any sort of synthetic fertilizer in your garden Long term is going to do damage. Short term, you're going to see great results, but long term, you're going to see damage caused into your garden, the repetitive use, especially in pot plants. If you're going to use a citrus fertilizer, and I'm not sure if that says it on the packaging, do not apply a, a synthetic fertilizer, slow release, fast release, whatever you want to call it, in a pot plant. It will cook the microbes and cook the fibrous roots in your plant. So compost, manures, that's it. And then our black grit, which is a all-rounder soil amendment fertilizer. What that does is it stops the burning process. It stops the over-fertilizing process if you are using synthetic fertilizer or fresh manures. It is certified organic. It's just a rock mineral. It's non, there's no, nothing's done to it other than crushed down into, the, in, into a coarse sand-like base. That's it. If you want to see what it look, looks like for those who have never seen it before, it doesn't melt, it doesn't dilute in water. It will not melt in water. The only time it will di dissolve is when it comes in direct contact with the excessive nitrogen fertilized soils. So when your plants are burning up on the edge of the rims or the leaves and things like that, that's all it does. It just burns, it, it stops the burning. It helps to unlock all the other micro and macro nutrients naturally formed in your garden to be absorbed by your plants and allows them and allows the microbes to be able to do their job. And the liquid fertilizers, well, you can use sea salt, you can use Charlie Cup, there's nothing wrong with those. Use all those natural 
fertilizers like that or get your favorite Nutrog. That's great as well. But when they start branding it as a tomato fertilizer, as a citrus fertilizer, as an Exalia camellia, it does my head in. It doesn't need to be that extensive. And they'll say, but no, there's a slight difference in the MPK in it. Yeah, there may be, but not enough to brand it to that point and confuse the home gardener. So find something natural form that's a good all rounder. Use that. If you want to try our liquid fertilizers, by all means try ours. Go with your favorite sea soil or maxi crop as long as they're organically made. Our Eco Boost, so you know, is a blood meal made from certified animal meal, basically. So the animals that are they collect the blood from, they're grass fed, they're grown naturally. Now, maybe a lot of vegans out there, my apologies, but this is a byproduct there that can't go to waste. So we've turned that into a natural form fertilizer. And our seaweed, well, I can tell you something, it's probably up there. You might know some great brand products here. Ours is there. And we've done the trials and tests and we can share that with anybody who wants to know. Beautiful. We've got a question from Kat. Yep. She's just planted some basil. Yeah. They've already started to go pale and losing their colour. Yeah. What could be the problem? Um, if the basil was grown on her own, if she could let us know if she grew the basil or bought the basil in, uh, that'll be the main reason. If it was bought basil like seedlings and you've planted it into your garden, no doubt they've come from a protected environment, slightly shady environment. And most seedlings, if not all seedlings grown by growers, um, trade secrets, they're liquid fed every day. So they have an irrigation system that runs through and there is a very small amount of liquid fertilizer added, whether it's every day or second day, that's pumped through the system as well. So as they're getting watered, they're getting the nutrients. As soon as you take it home, the environment changes, the microclimate changes, there's more sun than shade. They're not getting the same amount of liquid fertilizer. They'll go pale straight away. Start liquid feeding them as you would, as they do in the growing environment. You'll find huge results with it. So our EcoBoost and Liquid Gold will fix that straight away. All right, and Pauline wants to know, um, the soil in raised garden beds, should it be potting mix or bring soil from a nursery supply? Okay. Do they have different nutrients? They do. Um, it's a real tough one, that one, as far as uh, the soil from your local garden centre. If You have to do your research. You have to do the trial. It's a trial and error situation. Um, I won't say 90% of the time, most times the soil from a garden centre, the blend isn't quite as good as you would expect it to be. It will crust over, it goes hard if it's exposed to direct sunlight. So to combat that, I'll answer the question, a raised garden bed should be garden soil, composted garden soil, and it needs to be mulched. If you've got existing raised garden beds, they no doubt they'll drain a lot quicker. There's no base to them. If you've got a raised garden bed, if you look at our uh, Facebook page, our YouTube channel, you'll see the raised garden beds that I built that are a raised garden bed and a wicking bed at the same time. So they're not quite a wicking bed. And for those who don't know what a wicking bed is, it's like having a bathtub where the water can't escape until it reaches a certain level in, in moisture. So if the bottom part of the bed has 50 mil or 100 mil of water, that's a wicking bed. And if there are little weep holes at that point where any water above that water line where the holes are, it will drain out. That's what we call a wicking bed. And the roots draw their roots down to the base to absorb the moisture. So the soil above that water table is like a sponge and the roots grow down like a wick as a candle and they absorb that moisture up to hydrate themselves. The way I built my raised garden beds is with a plastic liner. Yeah, it's plastic. You know, it's not, it is biodegradable. Hopefully it doesn't break down too quick. But that plastic liner that we put at the base isn't folded up. So the bed sits on top of that and between the wall of the bed and the plastic liner, there's a hole where the water can drain out. But the bulk of the water sits on the liner itself. So the soil stays moist longer, but not moist forever. So using composted soil, garden soil, you'll probably need to add your own manure or compost on top. And 100% you need to mulch it. That's what's going to save your garden. All right, so on that, uh, Tanya's just popped in. She read that pea straw is a good mulch for veggies, but she can't find it anywhere. What are the best alternatives? I haven't realised. This, this is in the commercial grade. Um, you're, <laughs> lockdown's over. Go for a drive. You'll be able to buy a huge bale of pea straw this big, that big, which is equivalent to four or five of those package products from your local garden centre and hardware stores for about 10 bucks, nine bucks, as opposed to $16, which is only about this big, and you need four of them. So that little day drive that you're allowed to go out to do now, go to your local um, 
countryside and you'll find pea straw from the pet stock stores. Um, even that, so uh, pet supplies, large um, pet stock stores, are, uh, we've got one where we are in Bannockburn, Bannockburn Pet Stock. They've got bales and upon bales and they're all harvesting now. So they're fresh straight out of the paddocks. Go and check them out. They're a lot cheaper and it's a great day out. All right, Francine and Rebecca have asked the same question. They want to know organic or natural pest control methods. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> organic or natural pest control methods. There are far and few between as far as the natural. Uh, insecticides and fungicides. The one that I use, and I don't, I, I'm going to put it out there. I talk a, bit, a lot about it, natural insecticides and fungicides, and I practically do zero spraying. Um, I, I, I leave it up to nature and I leave it up to the plant to protect itself. If you've only got a small area and you don't have what I do on my little farm there, uh, you know, 50, 100, 200 plants, and I can afford to lose one or two, you know, that's been cheeky. Um, then you need to do that approach. And the one that I use as an insecticide, and I hope you've got your pen and paper ready, is in one litre of water, you add one teaspoon up to one tablespoon each of the following. Chili, now this can be chili flakes or crushed chili or powder. Chili, garlic, turmeric, olive oil, vegetable oil if you prefer, and a couple of drops of dishwashing liquid. And that's it, chili, garlic, turmeric, oil and dishwashing liquid, one litre of water, in a pot, bring it to the boil, let it cool down, strain it, then go out and spray. You can add to that one litre, if you like to kick up a little bit, 200 mils of vinegar, just normal white vinegar. That is your insecticide for everything. It's not gonna kill every insect it contacts. It doesn't last long on the plant, which is the benefit of it, because you don't wanna hurt predator insects, and it won't harm the bees. Never spray, no matter whether it's organic, natural, or otherwise. Never spray when your plant's in full flower. And if you've got tomatoes that are continuously flowering, try to isolate where the flowers are to spray the foliage. And the underside, 90% of the insects live on the underside of the foliage. That's your insecticide. You can use eco oil or eco neem if you don't want to make it yourself. And on the topic of eco neem, that is a insecticide that is designed to stop the digestive system working on insects. So it falls, you spray it on the plant, insect goes to eat, it breaks down its digestive system, it, its little nose that pricks onto the leaf uh, falls off, it starts to starve and that's what kills the insect, the bad insect. But if you read on the label it says not to be used on edible plants. Now, I've spoken to the creator, the manufacturer of this product, um, and the problem why they have is that it'll cost them a lot of money to get it registered for edible plants. It means you have to do trials in every season, in every state, on every type of edible plant there is for it to get approved. And they can't afford to do that. So that's why they've just put the label, do not spray it on edible plants, but it can be used as a fertilizer on edible plants. Go figure. If you do your research, you'll find that Econeme is used widely across the world, around the world, as an insecticide, natural form insecticide. So. If you're concerned, follow the instructions, follow the caution label on the label. Otherwise, you make your call once you do your research. So that's insecticides, fungicides. Uh, bluestone copper sulfite, natural forming rock, and hydrated lime, again, another natural forming rock. Both combine together to make your fungicide spray. Bicarbonate soda, one teaspoon of that in a litre of water is your natural form. Or 50-50 uh, milk and water is a natural, another natural form of fungicide. All well, bicarb and milk is from your kitchen pantry, and the blue stone is probably the only thing that I'd go to. Avoid manko zeb, avoid any other liquid fertilizer. Sulfurs, just, I don't use sulfurs, don't even touch. I don't even use blue stone, unfortunately. Well, fortunately for me, but if you can't stop the problem occurring, that's what you go to. Your first point of reference, as a wise man said to me, uh, prune. If in doubt, prune it off before it gets out of control. If you see a problem occurring on your plant, it's starting to die off on one leaf. Cut that leaf off. Clean the disease or the problem where the area is on the plant. If it's an insect, make the insecticide spray or shake the plant or hose it down when there's not too much sun or heat. But prune it off and if that doesn't work, then go to the first stage, which is a natural insecticide or fungicide. Keep going, we've got lots yeah, more questions. Just do the questions. <laughs> Alright, beautiful. So we've got a few questions about citrus. The first one was from Mary Lens and yeah. they want to know the mandarin tree lost all its flowers. Yeah. 
can they trick it into flowering again no, this year? Not easily. You can apply our liquid gold, which is a high potash uh, nutrient, uh, stibulant which would probably bring on some flowers. Uh, the only reason the tree would flower again is if you continually allow it to stress out. And if you do that, the tree will flower, but that's not a good way to do it. Okay. So a liquid fertilized with our liquid gold will help it. Perfect. So Kath was asking a question about her lime tree. The leaves of a small lime tree um, have planted in a pot as well as an orange tree in the ground are yellowing. Yep. What can I do? Okay, so it depends whether the tree is putting on new growth and there's lots of flowers on it because the energy will be pushed into that area and hence the old leaves will discolour a little bit. If it's because, if it's otherwise, if there are no flowers or very few flowers and just a small amount of new growth, then your tree is lacking the nutrients. So start liquid fertilising. Again, EcoBoost and Liquid Gold combined. 40 ml of each in 9 litres of water combined. Apply that every fortnight. Spray it on the foliage if you can and avoid the flowers if you, as best you can and apply it around the base. We'll fix that problem. Okay, beautiful. And we actually have a question about dragon fruit. Yep. Um, Rebecca's saying hers looks like it has root rot. Can she save it? Uh, they can probably... They, well, there is a very so strong skeletal stem inside the dragon fruit. So in... If it's rotting at the base, uh, that stem should still be intact. If that's come off, she'll have to re-propagate it. So she'll have to do short cuttings of the plant itself, depending on how big it is, and then repot them into some propagating mix or a sand-based potting mix or even the ground that's quite well drainage. She can save it, but she'll have to take it out of where it is. Is it in a pot, that's what you say? Mentioned okay. That. Rebecca, let us know. Yeah, so if it's in the pot, um, definitely you can repot it. It needs to be on the dry side and elevated. So they dragon fruit really do well in the you know, colder climates if they're sitting on a pedestal and they cascade over a little bit. It's um, quite a, kind of unusual. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, Evelyn's asking about slow release fertilizers. Are they actually okay for plants? That's it. No. I hope you got that answer. I don't like slow release fertilizers. I like sheep manure. That's slow release. Rabbit poo. That's slow release as well. So if you've got aged manure like that and it's in its full form, not crushed, that manure will take a while to break down. And who benefits the most out of this are the microbes, the good bacteria in the soil. They benefit from it because they, they, it's, if you, anybody who's ever made yogurt, you need culture to create more. And that, little pocket ball, the manure itself, is a bacteria waiting to come to life. So you just add water and it bursts out and it just billions upon billions of organic um, bacteria grows out of there, the microbes. Slow release fertilizer has nothing, zero, zilch. They can coat it with whatever they want on the outside, nothing. It's not gonna do any good and in long term, it will burn your plants. Um, it will cause damage, so no. Again, we're back onto citrus. Yep. How often should you water a citrus tree? Oh, million dollar question. I cannot tell you how often to water your tree unless I inspect it and I monitor it for you for, the, for a week to two weeks. It really depends on the soil. Citrus trees like moisture, but they need to dry out between the watering cycle. If your soil is holding moisture, long term it will struggle to grow. If it's struggling from now, it will struggle all the way through its journey. If you are able to get to the soil to drain well before you water it, then you're, you're going to win on that one there. I've got a few citrus trees and I'm, and I'm killing them because of the trials I'm doing. I've planted about 40 of them. I've got them in raised beds. I've got them in single raised beds. I've got them in the ground. I've got them in a lower section where it pulls out of water. And I've got them in areas where they get little or no water as well. Watering is, is important. You need to be able to make it dry out, drying out. But if you also have high winds in that environment, so if your tree is struggling because it's always wet and it doesn't dry out, plus it gets high winds, it will never ever grow properly. You need to lift it out of the ground to drain. And if it's in an environment where it gets high winds, you need to create a barrier to protect it whilst it establishes its roots. If you can get two or three years of protection created and good drainage and the trees establish its roots then it will look after itself but to get it to that stage you need to nurse it all the way through so drainage and dryness has to occur before you rewater right and 
and so on citrus still, <laughs> if you've got a small lemon tree and it's does not really producing many lemons anymore, yep. how could you help it along? It depends on the pruning. If they're not pruning it and it's not growing, it won't produce any lemons. If you start liquid feeding and composting it well, it will inevitably produce the lemons. You need, like I said just before about the trees draining well, if the tree's not growing, the roots, it means the roots aren't growing. And if the roots don't grow, you're, you're, in a, you're, you're losing. You're going to lose that battle. And I've got a couple of trees that are doing that. And I have to and readdress this issue because we've done the trials. We've monitored it for the last six months. And they've, what they've done is through stress, they put on flowers. But they've, those flowers fell off because the tree isn't ready. It's trying to survive. The purpose of a flower on any plant is to bring on afterlife, to bring on a new generation, drop its seeds, to regenerate new babies. And that's like anything, anything that's alive, we're here to reproduce. That's our primary objective as a, as a human being or as a living organism, to reproduce, to feed, enjoy, and make lots of babies. And that's what plants do. Now, if they do it because of stress, well, you'll see the results of that. They'll drop their flowers. You may be lucky to keep a fruit, but that may not grow to its full potential. Fix the soil, fix the soil and the roots. All right, um, Vali's planting big fruits. Yes. Uh, they're planting it, I'm assuming it's seedlings, and the next day it's vanished. <laughs> How can you protect the plants and seedlings? Uh, you can, if you want to do it with something from home, get yourself plastic milk bottles, the two litre milk bottles, cut the top and the bottom off of them, and just sit them straight over the top like a cloche, and, and bury it into the soil about that far around, around the seedling, and you'll have a little mini hothouse and a guard, a security guard protecting it. So if it's a little rodent or something like that, or birds, they won't get in, it'll deter them from that. Super duper. Um, the only other question we've got is actually an indoor question. Yep. Uh, an indoor money plant, should they be fertilised? So All indoor plants should be fertilised. Uh, there's no plant on this beautiful earth of ours that doesn't want to be fed, because we need to consider one thing. Indoor plants is something that we humans have created. They weren't born indoors. Uh, we live indoors and we want to bring the outdoor plants into our in indoor environment. So these plants obviously would grow in a shaded, protected environment, tropical environment, whatever it is. They are brought inside now in small pots. They definitely need to be fertilised. So a liquid fertiliser is a great way to do it. Do that every two weeks or once a month at least, or a small handful of compost that doesn't smell. That's great. So as you, as you water the plant, the nutrients are released down to the soil, which feeds the bacteria. That's it for now. There we go. All right. Is this plant still alive? <laughs> <laughs> okay. What we got here is a tomato plant. I cut it off. Now, I use a, if I can find it, my hand's in my pocket, mind that, little Stanley knife or pocket knife like this to do my grafting. I haven't sharpened this, so I dare say I ain't going to be as sharp as I'd like it to be. So the idea of grafting an eggplant, for those who haven't seen this earlier or heard me talking about it, I'm going to demonstrate how to graft an eggplant onto the... Wait a second, did I bring it? I did. Ah, close peg. <laughs> so that's my little trick to holding it together. So you can use a close peg, but the only problem is we've got plastic ones. I normally have timber ones. My darling wife um, decided to go this way because the timber ones in the full sun dry out on her. Um, so, and because the timber ones have got a better opening and more of a round opening, that you can see the oval shape on that. It may do the job, um, it may not, but, for the purpose of the demonstration, this is what I'm going to use for now. I don't see any close pegs here. I don't think they wash here. No, I'm joking. Um, what we're going to do here is take the eggplant and graft it onto the tomato rootstock because it is a better rootstock and more tolerant to our soils and environment and all that. So you'll be able to get eggplants a lot sooner by doing that. It is a little bit late in the season, but never too late to give it a go because it will grow and take on pretty quick. So I'm going to cut it just above. And I'll Bring it here for you, if you can see that. Does that help you? Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to cut it just above this little bud there. Why I do that is that you're not going to lose anything. That there can be planted still, so we haven't destroyed the little seedling. Yes, we've cut it back, but that has a root ball underneath that wants to grow. So it'll push those buds up and you can go and plant that out into the garden. So our little trial and error that we're doing here with our grafting, we really haven't got anything to lose. If this doesn't take, the tomato plant will grow anyway. So at the end of the day, both seedlings will survive. It's up to the graft whether it wants to take or not. So we remove these leaves like that, there, and that one there as well. 
to take away all the stress in the moisture that it's needed to keep it alive. Now, it's going to be very difficult to see, and I have got glasses, because as I get younger in my age, my eyes, I nearly poked my eyes out last time I did that, there we are. We're going to cut a V-shape on this, and I'm going to bring it up to the camera so you can see it closely. Let me just see if I can succeed with this in the first go, because it's tiny. Allow me to do this. One side. So it's like a flathead screwdriver, folks. That's all we're doing. Oh, nearly. There we are. I'm going to bring it up to you. And you tell me how close I can come to you for you to see it. Is that enough? Yeah, hang on. Yep. Hang on. You tell me if you want closer or further. Bit, for... that's, that's, that's just back at a bee stick. That's it. Yep. There we are. So you see that flathead? I've, I've cut a wedge shape on it. Now, I've left the bud there, and I'm, I'm in two minds about keeping it, depending on how far I need to bury it. What we're going to do is stick that into the tomato stem, into the stem. Now, the aim is, like every plant, there's a cambium layer. The cambium layer sits on the underside of the skin or the bark of the plant or the stem. And that's where the moisture flows. It's the pipeline where all the sap flows. That's like the, where the blood flows in our skin. That's the same thing here. So you need to line up if you're going to do it. That is, if you've got two different size in diameter stems. So if the stem is this thick like my finger, and that is that diameter there, only a quarter of a centimetre wide, I need to wedge it in, not into the centre, but into the side, so that we line up the two outer surfaces. And that's where the, the cambium layers line up, and that's how the moisture flows through. So now what we're doing is cutting a wedge on this tomato stem, and I'll bring it up to you once I do it. So I'm going to use the knife, sit it in the centre and just carefully rock backward and forward, not pushing too hard because it'll split it open too far, like that, see there we are. And just thinking about how deep I'm going, a little bit more wouldn't be too bad, there we are. Alright, so I'm going to put the knife down, and is this okay here yep, for you? Yep. yep, right. So there's the stem, there's a the split. Now, when you do this, try and not to handle it too much, you don't want any sort of uh, oils or dirt contaminating the cuts or the inner bark. And the same thing with this. Don't touch that and try and do it as quick as possible or do it in the shade. So am I in a good spot for you? All right, so what we're doing here is we're going to insert that in there like that. Put it so everyone can see to the right. That's it. Yep. yep. Okay, so we're going to insert that like that. Now, I'm going to turn it to the side to show you that I've lined up the one side you can barely see, it's only a, <laughs> a millimetre in, because it's almost the same size in diameter. But I've pushed it to this side, so I've got this side flush. I think I have, as good as my eyes can tell. And I'll keep turning it around so you'll see there's a slight gap at the bottom, but that's nothing to worry about. And I've allowed the bud... There we are. Perfect. Now, it's recessed in there, because it's lined up on that side there. Alright, and now all I'm doing is using a clothes peg to hold it together. And that's the purpose of the glow speed. So I'll put that on. Now, it may not be the perfect diameter. It may hold it, it may not. You can use buddy tape or grafting tape. And I'm hoping this is good enough. Yep. That's going to hold it together and keep it away from direct sunlight. Whilst it's so small and it's so fresh, you do not want to leave it in the sun to dehydrate it more than it needs to. This can sit in the shade. There's no need for sunlight at the moment. All it needs to do is heal, which will take a couple of weeks, and it will. the signs will be there. If it's happy, the growth will come. The longer you leave it in the sun, the quicker it will dehydrate, and that's what I'm going to do now. Put it somewhere to be protected. I can leave it just here. It will be fine. There we are. Done. So that's grafting, folks. That practical approach can be applied to almost any type of plant in your garden. Best time to do it? Well, not in the heat of the day or in the heat of summer. Uh, late winter, early spring, but for, that's for plants that are evergreen and for seasonal plants like that because they grow literally overnight. You could do it any time like today, for example. All right, Miss Silly, we've got a couple more questions coming in. One is about rhubarb. Yeah. How can you get the most out of your plant? Keep it in the afternoon shade, <laughs> as far as where you're planting it. I'll, I'll give you an example. I've got two rhubarb plants, and 
if you if you love what we do or what I talk about, <laughs> sign up to our Facebook or whatever they call it, uh, subscribe to it, our YouTube channel, and all those wonderful media platforms we have. Because you'll see me doing these demonstrations every morning um, in the sense that I'll have a rhubarb planted in one location and another one in another and do the comparisons. And for that, to answer that question, as far as the ability to grow two rhubarbs, these plants are in the same garden bed, which is about 15 metres long. The one to, as I'm pointing to your right, is in full sun from morning to afternoon, late afternoon. Whereas the one to your left, as I'm pointing, is in morning sun and afternoon shade. Both get the same amount of water and the only difference is one gets less sun than the other. Now, that one in the full afternoon sun has copped a beating. The leaves are so large, and keep this in mind, the larger the leaf, the less sun it needs. Unless it's a tropical plant and we're in a different zone. But in our environment where we are, and I'm down in um, Golden Plains, for me, anything large, even ca cabbages and broccolis and cauliflowers, the larger the leaf, the less sun they need. They've got that big leaf there to be able to absorb as much light into it to create the photosynthesis. So they don't need to be in full-blown sun for the whole day. So the rhubarb on your, your right, as I'm pointing, it has gone backwards the last couple of days of hot weather we've had and the hot scorching sun. The one on your left is thriving. It is huge. It's luscious. It's green. Same days, 15 metres apart, part shade, full sun. All right. I think this is going to be the last question and then we'll get you go through your products before we announce the winner of our prize. Okay. But Melissa has asked, and she's talking about shade, what is what are some of the best ways to shade your veggie patch from the patch from the hot summer sun? Her leaves are getting burnt. Okay. Uh, I'd love to know if, um, if she has mulch on the ground, if she's, her veggie patch is near a wall. Um, so shading your plant is not necessary unless it's, like I said earlier, large leaf, leafy plants. But if they're tomatoes and cucumbers, they shouldn't be burning up. And the only reason they're burning up is because your soil is dehydrating too quickly. Maybe there's not enough moss around the base. But if you've already done that and it's still not working for whatever the reason they are burning up and you've tried that, um, I find insect netting is great because that reduces by 30%. Uh, it's, it's, it is a, it's a netting as such, not like your bird netting with the holes. Insect netting is a lot tighter woven. It's, it's a great way to, to protect your plants from the sun and the insects, or the bad insects that is, um, and shade cloth. But only get the 30% shade cloth, nothing higher than that. Not 50% and certainly not 70%. And don't use bed cloths or um, bed sheets. That doesn't work. So shade cloth 30% on insect netting. All right, perfect. Um, I think that's about it for yep. now. Yep, okay. Um, oh, hang on. Excuse my lack of garden knowledge, but Teresa wants to know where you can buy top, topiary frames. Top. Topiary? Topiary, yeah. Topiary frames. Now, topiary frame, can we clarify that? Are we referring to topiary frame, which is creating a ball? Because uh, a topiary, as my understanding is, is a plant that's got a stem and then a ball structure on top or shape on top. If that's what she's referring to, there really isn't a place where you can buy topiary frames. Um, if you want to learn how to cut a, a plant into a round form, you need to get yourself a wire, curl it around as round as possible. Now you're going to have to work out how long you need it to get the right radius or diameter. And then once you hold that in place, you basically feed it over the top of the, the plant once you've cut it and you'll find where it's sticking out too much and not enough and always try and get it symmetrical because I've seen too many times the ball, the stem's there and the ball's off center from the stem itself. So we tend to cut too much and we're too scared to cut back. 90% of the time you can cut the plant back further than you think you can and it will recover. So, right. yep. Perfect, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut it after this one. Okay. But Rebecca's <laughs> asking, do dwarf feet beans need a support to grow. No, they don't need a support, but they may need to be, well, not a framework to climb onto, but rather a string around them to stop them from toppling over. So they'll only grow so high, depending on the type of dwarf bean she's growing. Uh, and if you've got a, a mass of them, sometimes it's good to put a couple of, or four bamboo stakes on both all four corners of the patch and run some string around the outside to stop them from falling over from the weight. Really good. All right, so one thing I need to uh, mention, and it's quite serious, it's not about product placement and selling, but um, be it all you can make your own, is fruit fly. 
Uh, about seven or eight years ago, I was invited by the DPI to Kensington. That was the first sighting of fruit fly in Victoria. Now, we've never had it before. Since then, it has gone out of control. It's in Yarra Valley. Um, and what it's doing to the growers down there in Yarra Valley is it's stopping them from being able to supply any produce to the local or supermarkets or in any form or shape because of the problem, the, the sightings of it. So, and they don't want to spread it. And that means, you know, families who've been farming there for generations have lost a season or two or if not three um, of seasons of growing and selling and making a living and income out of it. Uh, certified organic and otherwise it doesn't matter the fruit fly will come to your garden if it's there and once it lays its egg inside that little fruit of yours it is virtually impossible to control so you need to stop it before it gets to that point. Uh, any signs of fruit fly is basically rotting or you know molting of the fruit. You'll find a decay. It's quite unusual decay. It's not something you've probably seen ever before. Um, it doesn't die off as a brown patch only. It starts to ferment. It starts to become jelly-like inside. Uh, the larvae do penetrate quite easily and they go from fruit to fruit. One fruit means lots of fruit. One fly means thousands of flies. That's what they do. They lay eggs upon eggs upon eggs. Uh, We've been working with a company called Agnova. Uh, they've been around and they do a lot of commercial work with um, the industry. They work with, they're working with Yarra Valley at the moment. And because of what's happened in the commercial world, we've um, taken it upon ourselves to approach them and say, we need to get this into the home garden. And there's nothing in the home garden. Yes, there are some fruit fly traps out there. They work on a specific type. And we're talking about the male, male and female juvenile flies and the adult male flies. So it attracts the male flies predominantly. This catches basically every type of fruit fly, beating adult and young juvenile fruit flies, but more in particular, the pregnant female fruit fly, because that's the culprit. That's the one that's in, in, on the hunt to catch and find where the, uh, the, the ripening fruits are, or even decaying fruit. And the worst thing you can do is if you have any fruit falling or vegetables falling from your plant on the ground and you leave it there, that's where they're going to go. So don't look just on your plants. Look around the base and pick up anything you have. Because the way this works is with two lures. We've got your, <laughs> the way I call it, is your peanut butter, uh, your Vegemite, which is your protein, and it smells like Vegemite. It isn't, but it is a, it's a painted lure. I don't even know what's in it because I'm not allowed to know. And this is our bubble gum. So this has the perfect smell of ripening fruit. Uh, put these two together in your trap in here and you've got your sticky card. Now this mechanism or this system here in particular is the one that all the commercial growers across Australia are using. These come in the large form so that the discs are much larger and they apply one of these discs every 50 to 100 trees. One of these will do about 10 by 10 meters in your garden so and it'll last up to three months you can make your own you can get Vegemite and you can put coca-cola and peanut butter and honey in a bottle a couple of holes to catch them how effective it is I can't tell you I haven't done it myself I've worked with this myself so you have that option Vegemite and anything sweet like a honey and coke which is the only thing I would use coke for um, Hang that up in your tree in a, in a drink bottle with a couple of holes on the side. That will work. And citrus. We were speaking about citrus earlier uh, to protect your trees. CGWS is Citrus Guard White Spray or Citrus Gall Wasp Spray. Again, you were asking about insecticides. Well, this isn't an insecticide, nor is this. This is a trap and this is a shield. You apply that on your plants. And now we've done trials to protect our citrus trees from heat stress. As soon as the tree gets over 32 degrees or 34 degrees in temperature, it stops producing, it stops growing, it stops ripening. It goes backwards. It reduces the, the ripening and harvesting and growing rate by 10. This will speed up the process that much faster. So if you've got a heat period through the summer and it hits your tree, there goes the rest of the summer, there goes the autumn period. That's why you'll say to me in emails, my tree's got lots of fruit but they're not ripening. They've just gone through a heat cycle where they stressed the tree out and it won't ripen for at least months on end. This will protect it, it'll turn white like a ghost, but it does that. But now we've also done tests with the same product that works on codling moth, pear and cherry slugs. So we've sprayed CGWS on apple trees, on my apple trees and pear and cherry trees. Uh, which to control those two particular insects that cause a lot of damage. We found at least 70-80% success in controlling it. And I suppose I put that down to on how well I sprayed the fruit. 
it's going to turn white. It's a clay-based product. It's kaolin-based, but it also has a seaweed powder mixed into it. So it feeds your tree, but the kaolin is unlike your typical uh, makeup product they use in cosmetics. It's a much more refined product by comparison. Uh, and it does work by sticking itself, magnetizing itself onto the insect. Then the insect spends most of its life or part of its life trying to clean itself because it can't eat or digest or breathe, and that's how it kills it and stops it from growing. So that's CGWS, and you know about black grit. And if you've got codling moth again, if you want to use the spray or you don't like the white powder, codling moth traps, a natural form product, uh, lure. You hang it up in your tree, it's a delta trap. It's the shape of the delta, the letter delta, uh, with a lure inside. There's a couple of lures or three lures. You hang them up and you change them once the, uh, the lure's expired. And tree guard. So put that around the base of your trunk of your trees to protect them, to stop the caterpillars crawling up and looking for a place to land and egg, um, lay eggs as well. So these are protection mechanisms or methods rather than insecticides. And if you go down the insecticide path, keep it natural. It defeats the purpose of using an insecticide that's a chemical base that has a residual or if it's a systemic insecticide. There's enough toxicity going on in the world that we don't need to do it in our own backyard. If you're going to do something in your garden, do it for the pleasure of it, do it for life, do it for sharing with your family and friends. I can't stress that enough. If we constantly run for the first and the most easiest way of controlling a pest or a disease in our garden by using something chemically based that can have a bad effect and after effect on our environment, plants and ourselves, then don't do it at all. Just stop it completely and just rely on your local supermarket to feed you tomatoes when you shouldn't be eating tomatoes. I don't say that to insult anybody. I, I don't say that lightly either. Take it as you wish. I'm here to help you in the best way I can. Thanks for watching <laughs> and enjoy your gardening. From Eva Silly, Maresi. Yeah. Thank you. So Eva Silly, we just announced the prize winner of our garden pack that's going to get dropped off today. The winner is Tanya from Karen Jane. Congratulations, Tanya. You have won yourself this prize pack here with a hat, black grid, and everything I've been talking about today, and more importantly, the magazine. And folks, if you haven't subscribed, if I can just throw it out there, Vasily's Garden to Kitchen magazine is everything you see I do every day on TV and, um, and our social pages, plus more. We've got a, a, an amazing team of writers, all experts in their field. Uh, you've probably seen most of them on our TV show. The next issue is coming out in December, first, of, first week of December. If you become a VIP, you get four issues delivered to your door, plus you get access to the VIP lounge on our website, which means you can read all the back issues. They're available to you. And you have all the TV shows uninterrupted, no commercials, no frills, no, tr uh, no, no fancy things going on there. And you get all the discount prices on our VIP shopping uh, page. So everything you get is at wholesale, less than wholesale rate. You can't miss out on something like that. And you go in the draw to win one of three major prizes. I'm sorry to uh, <laughs> outbid you on this one. A VIP prize includes two and a half grand worth of gardening products. The second prize is 1250 and the third prize is 500 bucks. So three lucky winners to be drawn at the end of the month and they get delivered to your door as well. Let's hope they're all in Victoria. <laughs> Thank you. Are we still live? Do we stop? Yeah. Let's stop. Let's See you stop. later. Yep. Can I get you, I forgot to do the intro. Yep. So can I guess get you to do that intro? I didn't record, you said. Yes. Yeah,